and we were we were kind of talking about how we might prep or not prep for the show. We, we didn't prep, no, by the way. You couldn't. Uh, you couldn't tell, style. could you? Uh, Bob's yeah. wearing pants. He prepped. What are you talking about? I had two bourbons before the show. Off gassing a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogle. Good dive buddies usually turn into great friendships, and this group is no exception. In this roundtable discussion, I sit down with Bob, the dude, Larson, Terry, Big T, Irvine, and Jeff, Hefe Lindsay. Sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy as they share some funny stories, lifelong memories, and knowledge about diving in the Great Lakes. Please enjoy. Today, I am excited. We are having a round table about Great Lakes wreck diving, and I have some great guests. A couple of guests have been on the podcast before, and a new guest, which I'm very excited to introduce, but I'll let I'll go around, let everybody introduce themselves. We'll do uh, Bob, Jeff, or Hefe, and then Terry, Big T. All right. Well, Bob Larson, uh, diver on the Great Lakes. I spent... Uh... Spent like the last 12, 13 years running charters on the lakes. And now I'm, uh, past couple of years, I've just gotten back into diving with my buddies. And uh, we're doing some pretty cool big dives and having a good time with it. Uh, Jeff Lindsay, a uh, longtime diver on the Great Lakes, uh, born and raised there, exiled to the US now, but they let me back in once in a while. So, yeah. Well, I'm, uh, my name's Terry, Terry Irvine, AKA Big T. And uh, I've been diving on the Great Lakes for about, I guess it's, this was my 36th season on the on the lakes this year. So it was, it's been it's been a good run, and you know I've had I've had the opportunity to dive with these two guys quite a bit. Not as much as I'd like, but as much as I can. So thanks for having me back, Nick. Yeah, yeah, no, great, great to have this group on. I'm uh, I'm excited. I apologize. I know the routine. I just I just have my coffee. But what is what is everybody drinking? Tonight or today, I should say tonight. <laughs> what do you got, Bob? Well, I am drinking a uh, a nice bourbon from uh, Garrison Brothers uh, in my Great Lakes glass here. Enjoying that. And I've got the Boddington's Pub Ale, one of my favorites. And I'm kind of wimped out. I just got the uh, Diet Canada Dry. So <laughs> lean and mean. Yeah. <laughs> Big T, you get a pass. Thank you. I uh, I just got my coffee. Uh, just curious, uh, uh, w- have you had any Texas bourbon? I know that's kind of a uh, actually no bourbon. I am drinking a Texas bourbon. This oh okay okay. Texas. Oh okay, Garrison Brothers. Uh, I don't know if I want to say I don't know if I've had that actually. Um, I think it's a newer one. Oh okay, I'm not. Yeah. Have you seen the? There's a there's a documentary out there called Neat. Have you have you seen that documentary? Oh, yeah. oh okay. Absolutely. Yeah, there that's a. That's a good one. So a funny thing, after that documentary, uh, we were trying to get the bond, bonded, correct? That's what they call it when it's bonded. Yes. Yeah, we yes. were trying to go for the bonded bourbons to try to like step up our, you know, just step up our bourbon game, basically, me and my girlfriend. And we like to drink, obviously. So it got to a point where we'd be like, oh, okay, you know, the the bonded stuff is a little bit more expensive, So we'd go out and buy a bottle and be like, okay, you know, we'll just kind of sip on this. And then it'd be like two days later, the bottle's (laughs) gone. (laughs) Can relate to that, dude. We need to stop stop doing this sort of thing. Um, And then TX bourbon and then um, just some other some other random ones were were kind of our go to. But uh, enough about me. Um, So tell me about some some Great Lakes wreck diving. So, Bob, you said you were getting back into it. What was the last dive trip you guys did together? Oh, wow. I think the last – boys, you got to correct me if I'm wrong, but the last trip we did together was over the summer on the Bradley. It was the Bradley. Yeah, we were all there. Uh, I mean, that was uh, probably the biggest one any of us have done. And that's how we finished out the Great Lakes this year. Yep, yep. Yeah, Carl Bradley was, uh, that's a pinnacle dive there. It was a good one. Tell me a bit about it. Well, I think Hef can explain it best. I He, he puts it well, better than I do. <laughs> before we get into the details of the shipwreck, I want to talk about how we got there and what we, what we assumed we could do versus what we actually did, right? Because we have planned six days diving 
out oh, on the Bradley. Geez. We thought six day yeah. window. Now we knew it's out in the middle of Lake Michigan. There's no shelter. So it's a bit dicey. We thought, well, out of six days, maybe we'll get three or four days, right? Well, long story short, we got we got yeah. one day. Day three is what we got, and that was it. But when we got out there, the dude or Bob, I, I, I he's the dude to me. He'll always be the dude. We all got nicknames. Yeah, uh, the dude and, and Steve uh, put a line on it. So I'm forever thankful to those guys because unlike a lot of shipwrecks that you think of where you pull up and it's moored and you go down the line and have a dive and come back up, you need to locate the Bradley. There's no mooring lines on it. And we're, what, 40 kilometers, 20, 25 miles, something like that offshore? Yeah, we're 25 miles offshore. So we're a long ways out. The water's deep. We don't know exactly where the wreck is. We've got numbers. But when we get to it, well, then we need to put a mooring line on it. And that's what uh, the dude and Steve did. So I'll let you take it from there. But I think that was that was pretty epic that you guys sacrificed. Well, I think getting the mooring on was quite the challenge. First, we had to not only locate the shipwreck. It's how, what is it, 660 feet long, roughly, somewhere around there. And we wanted to dive the bow. So we had to not only locate the wreck, we had to locate the bow. So I drove the boat. I got us over. We got the shot line dropped right on the bow. Actually, I'm not going to claim that I'm this good because I'm really not, but uh, we dropped it about two feet from our ideal tie-in point, And then the dive started and we went down and uh, we were able to get the line tied into it. Problem being is, you know, when the shot hit the wreck, the wreck hasn't been dove. It's not like a lot of wrecks that people are diving, you know, every year, year after year, there's dozens of people on it. This one, we figured it had been 10 to 12 years since it had seen a diver and it was covered in silt. At, at that point, you're a little over 300 feet and in zero visibility. And so you got to locate it, the line, then get the chain apart, and tie it in to where you wanted to and something secure. And we basically did that at, at a, right around 300 feet and zero. So this is the civilized world, Bob. You got to speak metric. No one knows what the hell feet is. <laughs> so, fuck. I don't know how deep in metric we did this. I don't know, a thousand, a hundred. I'm not Let's call sure. it fifteen kilometers. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I I speak in American. You like so? Some, you speak American, do you? <laughs> I speak American. Just a a, a question because I'm not sure. I like obviously I know the the term shot line. Um, and, and, and I apologize for my ignorance, but when you're dropping a shot line, is it basically you're, you're just kind of dropping an anchor? So basically what we had was we, we, we just run a small line with a weight on it to throw over to the boat to sink. And then we take a mooring line down because in this case, we wanted to leave a mooring line on it because, you know, in our head, we were coming back there the next day and the next day and the next day. So our plan was to put a line on. So then the next day, there was no screwing around. We could head right to the wreck, get on it, and go diving. That was our plan. So actually, I believe the way we did it this time was we made the mooring line, that the like three-quarter inch poly line, and we put a big weight on the end of that. And we threw that over, had it floating at the surface and the line all the way down to the wreck. And then I undid the weight. Uh, tied us in using the chain to the wreck. And then the weight that we had on it, what we usually do is we take out our, our marker buoy, we tie that onto the weight and shoot it up. When the boat sees the marker buoy at the surface, you know, it's standing upright because it has a weight on it. They pick that up and that signal signals to them that they can go over to the other end of the line and tie the boat in. They got time because the time it took us to do it, we had a couple hours of decompression. So we were, you know, they didn't have to hurry. So they just had to pick that up and then go tie us in. It seemed to work pretty well. It worked great for us. I mean, you guys got screwed out of a dive on the Bradley, but thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, we got on the wreck, but uh, I didn't get to see see it like you guys did. So, so Hefe, I, I think to help Nick, I think it'd be cool to kind of give a little bit of history of the Bradley but also talk about the condition of it and the depth of it, because it, it really 
it adds weight to what Bob did. And then the photos that Hefe took once he got down on it, we were, you know, we got a dive on it. So I don't know, Hefe, you did, you have more history on the, you have more knowledge of the Bradley than the rest of us. So why don't just kind of give us a bit of a description there? Yeah, sure. I, on my computer beside me, I have some notes, so I'm not going to pretend I know this much about <laughs> it, but it happens to be right here. I'm glad you asked. Uh, let's see. It was 639 feet long, and it was the flagship of the Bradley Transportation Company. So when it was built, it was the largest ship on the lake. It was built in 1927, and it sailed until 1958. Um, so this was a big, a big ship. So what's 640 feet uh, in meters? It's, it's a lot. I don't know, Nick. Help me out. <laughs> two, two something. Meters, yeah, 200 yeah. some meters. I, I don't know. Anyways, it's November 18th, 1958. They, the crew thinks they're totally done for the season. They've delivered the last load of stone, and they're headed to winter layup. So in the Great Lakes, they freeze up, and the shipping comes to an end, and everybody gets a couple months off to go home and have Christmas and see the family, and, and that's that's the sailor's tongue off, right? So it's November, and they think everything's awesome. Job done. Let's go to port. They know the ship is a bit – it needs repairs, and so that it's going to get repaired when it gets to port over the winter season. And they're almost back to, to where they're going to winter for the season. They get a call uh, to say, well, we got one more load of stone. The prices are really good right now. Head back to home port, pick up a load of stone, and go deliver it somewhere. So they have to change course. Uh, they're still on Lake Michigan. But then all of a sudden, the storm that they figured they were going to dodge hits really hard. And they've got like seas running 15 meters, 40 feet. And this 640 foot ship simply just split. It broke its back, they call it. And it just, it broke in the middle. And uh, within a few minutes, the ship was gone. They sent out a mayday. Um, and again, this is November. The water is ice cold. It's just above freezing. It's actually, the air temperature is below freezing. So water is freezing on the ship. There was a crew of 35. Only two survived. Four made it to the life raft immediately after everybody abandoned the ship. So there was four that survived, uh, four that made it to the life raft. And then uh, I think it was seven hours for help to arrive. And only two remained alive because it was just so cold, right? And so that's how, unfortunately, a crew of 35 ended up losing their ship. But uh yeah, that's the Bradley. So it's a massive steel ship. It looks a lot like the freighters that still sail the lakes today, which is kind of, it's kind of, it really surprises me. Well, and is, and I believe it's the second largest wreck in the Great Lakes. It's the second largest wreck in the Great Lakes itself. Next to the fifth. It's the largest diveable shipwreck. So the Evan Fitzgerald's a little bit bigger, but it's off limits to diving. It's a, a protected heritage site for whatever reason. It's different. There's, there's a lot of rules there. Um, but the the Bradley is not. Uh, but yeah, it's the largest diveable shipwreck on the Great Lakes. So it's it's pretty special. We've been wanting to do it for a long time. Yeah, that's for sure. Why is is it just because the depth of it's not dived as much because it's it's such a task to get to? Well, I think the depth has a lot to do with it. Definitely does because that really limits the amount of qualified divers. The depth, the cold, the amount of decompression you have to do. And just the logistics of getting there. Like we said, we had six days planned up there and we were lucky we got that one day in. So it's in a fairly remote location. So it's not somewhere easy to get to. Just the harbor. There's not a lot of places to stay. It's not really a much of a town. There's what, one or two restaurants and that's about it. And a uh, little tiny harbor. I mean, we were basically pulling the boat every night and boarding at the launch ramp. It's just logistically, it's a tough one to do. And then, you know, you put take that into account with the depths and the cold and all that, and it's not no very often. Yeah, and that's that's the key thing for me is the temperature. Like you hear people diving shipwrecks in, you know, the 110, 120 meter range all the time, right, Nick? Like it's not a big deal to do the Britannic. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's a big deal to do the Britannic. And, you know, but you're dealing with water that's, what's the temperature in the Britannic, like 25 C? 28 C like it's warm right top to bottom. I think once we broke through 10, 15 meters temperature here would be three, maybe four C. 
So the whole dive, you're in that kind of water until you get back to that thermocline. So, so think about that. You're in 100 plus meters dealing with temperature that's just above zero, right? So I mean, that there's a level there that it compounds the the challenge that you're doing. So it's so it's uh it's out there. It's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, we look at 15, 20 minutes on the shipwreck. I mean, now you're talking two plus hours to get out of the water. So you got to plan. Can I take this cold that long? That really comes into account, you know? I think we all feel like when we're on the dive, like, do you guys feel the cold when you're actually on the bottom? Because I don't. I'm too busy. You did on the moonlight in Lake Superior. Well, yeah, when the suit floods, that's a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> but when everything's going good. <laughs> if, if I have water that's one degree C pouring in on my crotch, I feel that right away. Um, <laughs> luckily, that didn't happen on the Bradley. And everything is good, but but to Bob, to Bob's point, like when you finish the the dive, you leave the bottom, right? Then you've got an hour and a half, two hours of deco ahead of you. That's when the work starts. It really gets cold quickly. Yeah. At that point, you're probably heated vests, things like that. Like you almost need to correct. Like I, I'm. A... Yeah, we don't go in without those anymore. That's been the best invention to help Great Lakes divers. Is the heated gear we wear, you know, I have the gloves. I love them. It, it's a game changer. Yeah. Like I got a heated suit, the whole, the whole undersuit to heat And it just, it makes a world of difference. Not only the heated suit, but I, I know at some point we're going to talk about this anyway. So I think the use of the migration that we did from open circuit doubles and stages to the rebreather has been a, a huge game changer for us as well. On, on the dive that we did on the Bradley, we had to carry a lot of bailout gas because we had to plan for that contingency. But we're also breathing a lot warmer air. We're, you know, we're breathing nice, moist, warm air. And, uh, you know, in, in times when we've had to bail out, we didn't notice the difference right away on the difference in temperature. Now you're breathing refrigerated air every breath. So it's... Uh, Certainly, the, the rebreather has helped us with some of these deeper dives. Very much so. over the last five years, say. I'm really digging the very white voice you got going there, team man. I see the cold is hanging on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been I've I've had a cold for two weeks, so yeah, this is this is my radio voice. <laughs> Sexy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious, how did you all meet? They showed up on my boat, and I couldn't get rid of them. Didn't we meet in prison? I thought we were all in jail at the same time. <laughs> no, that was another time. That was someone else. <laughs> so I know Jeff and Jeff and I, Hefe and I have always talked about, we, we can't really remember exactly when we met. I, I remember a dive trip back in 2003 that we did together in the lower Great Lakes. And we were diving in Lake Ontario. And it was sport diving depths, but we had incredible visibility because uh, I think we had a, I, don't, I think it was a cold winter, if I remember, but we had visibility in the lower Great Lakes in June that was 120 feet easy. And uh, Jeff was shooting video, and I think I was shooting video as well. And we, we kind of hit it off right from there. And then we started going cave diving together. And we didn't meet Bob till a little bit later on. And, you know, we'd never done, uh, we spent almost 30 years and we never touched. Lake Michigan. We've never we never went to Milwaukee. We never did anything like Michigan. We kind of ah, eh, we got the other ones. We're we're good. And then the first trip we went to Milwaukee, we met Bob, and that that changed our perspective completely. We we fell in love with Lake Michigan, that whole area, Chicago, Milwaukee, and of course, you know, he's the dude. You you can't not like the dude. The dude abides. That was I think Bob. <laughs> that was I think it was two thousand four that I met you because 2015 I was on the machine so that's how I remember yeah. that was my second year yeah you were on open circuit when we started diving yeah and uh and I don't know every year since then and then uh I backed off on the charters and uh well I got a little story that t-man did I was uh I was ready to kind of take a break from diving you know I, I needed my time away from it for a little bit and uh, T was over at my house for a visit, and he's trying to convince me to go uh, to go cave diving. And I've been cave diving for many years, but I said, ah, I don't know, I don't know, and he's pushing me to go. And I had gotten rid of a previous rebreather, and I had bought a new one, but I, I hadn't used it much. 
And I said, well, I'll go on the trip with you, but I'm going open circuit. And he says, okay, okay, okay. Sounds good. Next thing I know, we're at the house and big T's going through my rebreather, figuring out what I need for it. Next day when he gets home, he tells me he already picked up the parts. It's ready to go. Just bring it to Florida. You're diving that. <laughs> and uh, like I say, I know we were in Eagle's Nest that, that week. So here I was ready to kind of hang it up for a bit and take a break. And uh, T-Man decided otherwise. And I'm very glad you did that. And we've been we've been doing a lot of big dives ever since. It's been a lot of fun. When Big T makes a phone call, you answer. <laughs> well, that, 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 sort of, that sort of developed the unofficial Team Revo for the uh, Midwest, didn't it? I think it did. Yeah, we are the unofficial Team Revo. We can't get anybody <laughs> to actually sponsor us. Did you, did, you buy a, did you buy a machine yet, Nick? I know last time we spoke, you were thinking about it. I, this year, it will happen. It will happen this year. Um, I actually did get to do a tri dive on a Revo. I did a tri dive on a Revo. I did a tri dive on a Liberty and then a, a Liberty side mount and then a Choptima. And I did like the Revo the most because the instructor that I'm working with, the one I actually got drunk on the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> um, he, uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's the guy to go with. It was a fun. It was a fun recording. <laughs> although, like I said, just the next day, just kind of that like little slight hangover, listening to myself. Like, did I really say that? You just deleted the whole thing, um, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, it's it's released to the public, uh, heavily edited, but released to the public. I think I even make an apology at the beginning of the podcast. Like, yeah, I got a little little drunk. Rum and me don't mix great sometimes. <laughs> But no, so this year it will happen uh, because it, the the kind of like you're saying, just going from open circuit to close, the advantages. So after I finished a course, the ANDP course, I started looking at obviously mixed gas. I think it's kind of a natural progression going into to helium. And a lot of talk was just kind of thrown at me like, if you're going to go that route, you might as well go the rebreather because it's just cost these days, things like that. So well, at this point, it's cost prohibitive to dive open circuit trimix. I mean, the cost of the class for all the training dives you're going to do paid for your buying a machine. Yeah. I mean, it's it's getting that expensive now. Yeah. And that's especially out here in, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, it's definitely just not cheap. So that's why I started looking into it. And, but no, uh, the, the unit is not bought yet, but there will be at some point this year, I'm actually headed to, uh, Mexico later this year in about two months to start my overhead cool. training. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm venturing well, into that. Good for you. Um, but, uh, uh, tell me a little bit about the charter you ran. You said you just took a break. Bob, and then, and, but you ran one for, for a few or more than a few years. So I, I ran a charter majority of the time was out of Milwaukee. Milwaukee is a, a great area for diving because, you know, I can put you on a wreck in 20 feet of water or in 300 feet of water. And for the most part, everything is within six or seven miles of the Harbor. So there's no long runs. We can run two trips a day get four dives in every day. Um, unless we start doing night dives and we can do more. It was really great. And I, I, I would have groups that would come in, uh, you know, they'd come in for a week at a time. And not only were we able to, you know, go diving, we're able to, I, you know, I was able to take the groups out and show them the city and show them, you know, different bars and restaurants and things to do. And, you know, I'd have groups like these guys when they'd come up. I think you guys always hoped we'd get at least one weather day just so we could all go out and do things. So, you know, I ran a six pack boat. I, I really preferred to run more technical charters than recreational charters. Just my opinion, the caliber of diver we had was a lot less headache for me. You know, the recreational divers got very repetitive and required a lot of work where the technical divers, for the most part, I could pull up and say, okay, go get off the boat and we're done. So, uh, so dude, I, I got to interrupt. Can you tell us a couple stories? Come on. Oh, Tell no. us some stories <laughs> about oh, your favorite no. charters and dealing with cold water. Come on. Come on. People are going to love this. These guys know all the stories. So half, 
Hef, why don't you just pick one oh, and boy. tell me where to um, start? Which one would you like to hear first? Diaper Boy is pretty good. Can we hear about Diaper Boy? Oh, my God. This guy, this guy goes out and he buys himself a brand new semi-dry wetsuit. Okay, semi-dry, not a dry suit. It's a semi-dry. The way a semi-dry wetsuit works, water gets into your suit, and then it stays inside your suit. <laughs> and your body warms it up, and that keeps you warm. Well, he didn't want to pee in his new suit, and so he didn't want it to smell. So he decided it would be a good idea that he wore a diaper <laughs> underneath his new semi-dry suit, forgetting that the water has to come in. So that little blue absorbent stuff that's inside those diapers, I know, I know what color it is, because trust me, I'll get there in a sec. It absorbs all the water. When he got on the boat, I had one rule. No wet clothes inside the cabin. You change, you get your stuff off outside. Well, this guy walked into the cabin, peeled his semi-dry suit off, <laughs> and his diaper exploded. And this shit went everywhere. A year later, I was still finding it in the little nooks and crannies on the boat. This guy had stuff everywhere. Now, I did make him clean it all up. And he's like, what? It's not my boat. I said, well, if you want to get back to the harbor, you're going to clean it up. That, that was part of my problem the last couple of years. I started, I was a little harsh with some of the divers. It was deserved, yeah. Well, they deserved it. I think as far as customer service goes, there might have been better <laughs> options. There's a few of those in particular, but but I can remember you explaining to him like, "Look, you can't wear a diaper under a semi-dry suit." <laughs> yeah. All right. But they tell me I don't know what I'm talking. Prove about. me wrong. Okay. And I mean, <laughs> why would I know? You know, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I was an uh, recreational and technical instructor, rebreather diver, cave diver, trimix. <laughs> And they're telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. So, okay, <laughs> prove me wrong. And then they blow up a diaper all over. And then they're upset that I made them clean it up. So, yeah, there, there, there was that one. That was that was a fun one. I had, a, I had another guy. I don't want to get too specific, but he was a Midwest cave diver. We do have caves here in the Midwest. And uh, he came up to dive with us in in the lakes. In early May. Really cold. Early May, it's really cold. <laughs> really cold. So the guy's gearing up, and he's getting ready to get in. And I notice he has the fingers cut off all his gloves. I say, hey, man, come here. Hold on. Don't go yet. Let me grab a pair of gloves for you. He tells me, don't tell me what to do. I'm a cave diver. This is how we do things. I said, well, that's cool, man. I'm a cave diver, too. <laughs> but you're not cave diving. It's May and you're in the Great Lakes. I will give you a pair of gloves. <laughs> he repeats himself not to tell him what to do. Okay, go. Well, it was probably eight minutes later. No, I don't think that's what you said. I think you may have <laughs> added a few expletives to that. <laughs> well, trying to not say fuck too much. To go help him off the boat. He could go forth and multiply. <laughs> so, yes. So he gets off the boat. It was it was under eight minutes later. He's at the back of the boat, and he, he's shaking. He's so cold. And I said, well, get on the boat. He says, I can't grab the ladder. I said, look, I don't know. That's what you cave divers do. I thought this is how things go. And uh, he never came back. He I had to drag him up on the boat because his hands wouldn't move to grab the ladder. <laughs> You know, I mean, but again, what do I know? I oh, mean, God, it's cold. Great Lakes, May? Yeah, who needs oh. gloves? <laughs> I mean, th there's a lot of that. And and, and again, that's why I, I like to more pick and choose my groups. These guys, these guys got on the boat. This was not a charter with them. It was just, hey, let's just go diving and have a good time. I'll stay on the boat. And that was it. And we just would have a blast. I know, Nick, when we talk about Great Lakes diving, I know there's certainly a perception that, you know, it's freezing cold all the time. And, you know, there, there, there really isn't any Great Lakes dive that we do that we're not either in a full dry suit with full dry gloves. So, you know, we're not trying to dismiss that as a myth. But, 
you know, we, we get strategic and we start off the season usually in the lower lakes, Lake Ontario, maybe Lake Erie, do a bit of diving there. And we work our way up so that we hit Superior usually by August. So we're, and, and if we're up there in August, we'll get temperatures of, you know, 55, 60 degrees from 40 feet up. And that's where we really need it. You know, when we're doing our 20 foot stops, hanging out there for 45 minutes an hour, you know, we, we, we make ourselves sound tougher than we really are sometimes, but, you know, certainly it is cold water diving and, you know, nobody that's doing it seriously, certainly nobody doing technical would do anything other than, you know, dry suit with full undergarments and typically heated undergarments, you know, like we've talked about, but I think what, you know, when we do this, if you look at some of Jeff's photos, you know, we've, we've, we've been starting to get better visibility. You know, Lake Michigan is phenomenal. The, the photos that Jeff took on the Bradley, you know, he's, he's at 320 feet and, you know, we're getting, we're getting, he's getting back and getting shots with a wide angle lens, a fisheye lens. That's unbelievable. So it's, if you like shipwreck diving, the Great Lakes is certainly a great place to come and explore. You know, and all the all the wrecks, everything is fresh water, so everything is preserved. It's an exciting spot to dive. So, like like T said, we try not to go too far north early, but there was that one year we got suckered into going to uh, to Lake Superior in June. I think you remember that, T. And I can clearly yeah, I remember my, my computer's reading. It read one degree on the bottom, and on the surface, on the surface, it was two degrees. So we doubled our temperature, but two C on the surface is. That's challenging. That's tough. <laughs> I'm still trying to warm up. Yeah, the the year we dove the uh, we found the box car when we were looking for a CPR 694. That previous year, Lake Superior had frozen to within 93 percent over the winter, and uh, so we're up diving it in August. The year we found the box car, and we did not hit a thermocline until we we were in 14 feet of water. So we were literally just kind of trying to get up as, as high to the surface as we could just to get, you know, get a few extra degrees out. And it was, it was one of the most uncomfortable dives from a decompression standpoint. And it was, it was right after that dive. That was the last dive I did in Lake Superior in open circuit. I decided I was either going to quit Trimex diving or I was going to move to a rebreather. And following year we were, I was on a rebreather. Jeff, just a, a quick question or hefe. <laughs> um, the uh, how? What are the challenges of like photography when the water is that cold? Because I, I would assume, or I, I don't know much about underwater photography other than looking at pictures, but I would assume that there's probably <laughs> quite a bit of challenges going into that. The colder the water, you just need a really good camera. That's what he does. Just use AI. Don't even go diving. Just. <laughs> Just let AI do it all. Don't worry about it. No. So b- before I answer that question, Rick, these other two guys are both phenomenal photographers as well. So they may say they're they're not, but I've seen what they do. So they're both very good. But well, when we're talking with the best photographer in the Great Lakes, oh shit, <laughs> it's hard to compare. Yeah. Um, what are the challenges for me? The the biggest challenge it would be. Uh, just the gear, like the dry gloves. So you really need to know your camera. You'll be in a spot where you just need to know where all the buttons and controls are, right? You really can't see it that well. It's pretty dark at times. Uh, You've got big, thick gloves on. You're trying to strike a balance between keeping your hands from turning blue and being able to feel the controls. So you gotta find out what works for you in terms of thermal protection for your hands. But the best part by far diving the Great Lakes with a camera is there's no rinse needed. It's been rinsed for three hours when you come back. So it's totally good to go. Just pack it away and it's great. But no, it's, um, uh, what about you guys? Do you find any challenges with uh, your cameras? No, I think you pretty much nailed it. It's just a lot, you know, it's a lot of extra gear. We're already carrying a lot of gear for these dives that we do. And now you're throwing that in. And, you know, one of the things I really enjoy, one of my, and Hefe is not going to believe me. I I actually like not taking my camera and taking lights for Hefe. I don't. And I enjoy that. I really do. He doesn't like asking people to run lights for him, but I enjoy doing that. And, I mean, he's a better photographer than I am. I fully admit that. 
and I like helping him get those good shots. And I, I think for me, that's a lot of the fun. I've seen your photos of the Rosenko in uh, uh, outside of Chicago. I thought that was pretty awesome. So, <laughs> all right, I'm working on it. I think, dude, that's a, that's a really good point, though, Nick. One of the things because Hefe and the dude and I dive together a lot, and because we've all been behind the camera and been model, we certainly probably have better underwater communication than certainly if I'm diving with somebody outside of this group when we were diving the Bradley per se. You know, I was I was Hefe's model. I was one of a couple models that Hefe had, but we kind of intuitively know we know where Jeff wants to go. <clears throat> a lot of times, we'll we'll try to get ourselves set up. You know, the offboard lighting, so on, and it certainly it helps because it takes a while to get that shot set up. And one of the things we find when we're diving with people that either are not photographers or not models, we might take ten minutes to set up the shot that Jeff really wants. And, you know, we've dove with people that one click and, you know, they've moved on. So I think I've said it before previously with you, Nick, like it, it really sucks being a model, right? Like it's the worst thing to hang out for a photographer because I'll camp out in a spot and I'll expect the model to stay there with me for the next half hour. Well, who wants to do that, right? It's the worst thing ever to dive with a photographer. Oh, no, the worst time it is is when you're in Lake Huron and you have a completely flooded dry suit on the Spangler and your photographer, you give him a thumbs up and say, let's go. And he says, no, just a few more around the stern. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but look at the photos. I mean, you're, you're memorialized for posterity, dude. Photos of you on the Spangler. I know yeah. Karen loves those photos. With the duct tape holding my neck seal together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Karen, Karen tells me how much she loves those photos of you. Yeah. Hefe oh, will yeah. tell you that being a model is <laughs> awful. It's, it's, it's completely awful until you get a, you know, super awesome photo that you're hanging on your wall that you're looking at as we're, as we're doing a podcast. <laughs> you know, it's. I can think of a few I got hanging up here. I was down boosting O2 today and I got my photo. There's a photo that Jeff took of me on the bow of the Judge Hart. And the Judge Hart is a small small freighter up in Lake Superior and it's certainly one of my one of my top five wrecks and every time I see that you know takes me back to some some awesome dives we've done on on that wreck and in that lake so it's you know the the worth the work is is certainly worth the reward for sure so that reminds me Big T why don't you tell us the differences between the lakes specifically why Lake Superior is so different than the other four but the big thing with Superior is, you know, again, as you usually no, no surprise that Superior tends to be the one I like the most. But Superior is the only one of the Great Lakes now that still hasn't got the uh, the invasion of the mussels, quagga mussels, the zebra mussels. So when we're diving wrecks up in Lake Superior, the visibility will always be less than what we would see, say, in Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. But the detail is there. So if we're diving... You know, Jeff Jeff has some photos of the comet in Whitefish Point, and you can see the, the paint very clearly on the boiler. And, you know, when we do the Judge Hart, the Judge Hart sank in November 1942, you can read out the name Judge Hart very clearly on the fan tail. There's no muscles on it or anything like that. So all the detail is there. And, and that's, you know, unfortunately that's one of the things we we miss in the other lakes is we've lost that detail. We have much better visibility. So we're able to capture more of the wreck in, it, in its entirety or certainly, you know, a larger scope, but we miss the detail. So it, it depends with, you know, with the Bradley, you know, we gave, gave that up so we could get better visibility and you can get a sense of the scope and the size of the wreck. But, you know, each, each lake has its own, unique flavor, I guess. I think most of you guys could probably look at a photo and tell what lake it was taken in, even if you don't know the wreck. Like, I think I can. Yeah, they each look different. I think you're probably, I'd be pretty close. Yeah, Michigan, you know, it was funny, as I say, you know, we, di we didn't, we didn't start exploring Lake Michigan, at least Jeff and I, till, till later in our career. But, it, you know, we kind of regret that now. You know, there's so much cool stuff out in the Midwest. And we've certainly... You know, we, we met the dude that way, but we met a whole group of divers in the Midwest that 
they're way more active than, you know, any group that I have in, in my area near Toronto, you know, and just, they're a great bunch of people to hang with. They're all, they all show up to play and it's easy. Prodigious drinkers as well too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, not Bob. What are you talking about? Not me. I is there any for Lent? No. no. <laughs> Uh, is there any plans to to try to make it back to the Bradley? Oh man, I the dates didn't line up for me. You might go. I don't know. There's talks for next year, isn't there? Oh wait, or is that on or off? I don't even remember now. There is plans to go back. Yeah, we're working on it. We're working out dates. We're trying to figure it out. I think we got some unfinished stuff to do on that one. I've got unfinished business with the Bradley. We only saw a fraction of it, so there's. There's another 600 feet I want to see of the Bradley, so I'd love to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we got plans to get back there. Uh, I actually hope that maybe this year we can get out, get the numbers for the Ironton. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, out in Lake Huron. That's one, you know, we've spent the last couple of years diving uh, the Ohio out there, and uh, the Ironton's another one. It's the one that collided with it, I believe, right? And uh, it's nearby, but we have not located it, but Noah has. And they're just not releasing the numbers yet. So we're hoping that this year we can actually acquire the numbers and uh, get out on that one. That would be another big one. Ohio is pretty special. Tell me a little bit about the wreck. Do you want, do you want to, Bob, or do you want me to do it? No, nope. you, you got it, Half. Um, well, let me just take a look at my computer over here. <laughs> and I'll talk about the Ohio. <laughs> Uh, let's see. It was um, it was built in 1874. Uh, it was lost in 1894. It was a little over 60 meters long. It was a it's a wooden cargo ship. And uh, what else? It was had a single steam engine in it. it. Was located in 2017 inside the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. <clears throat> we dove it in 2022, 2023, and uh, it rests in about. 90 meters, I think is where it sits. But I will say about this, the, the, the visibility we had in 2022 on the Ohio was... Oh, my God. I don't know. What would it be, Bob? I bet you it was probably, I think, at least 150, 150 foot visibility. 150, 200 feet? Conservatively. That was on the short side, yeah. So Easily. And, and that was the trip. We had a plan to go out there. We were out there six, seven days. And we had planned to dive four or five different wrecks. I think we spent like five days on the Ohio. Yeah, we were going to go all over and see this wreck and that wreck. And then I think after the first dive on the Bradley, the whole team was like, screw that. On the Ohio. We're going to stay on the Ohio. And I think after three days, we said, oh, that's three 300s in a row. Let's take a break. We brought it down to like a 200-foot dive for a day. And then we went right back to the three. Right back to the Ohio. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, the the Ironton collided with the Ohio, and in about thirty minutes, both of them sunk. And like I say, the the Ohio was located in twenty seventeen, and it was released to the public, and we dove it in twenty two, twenty three. But they never released the numbers for the Ironton, um, which was located in twenty nineteen. Maybe this will be the year. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Why do they hold on? to the numbers like is it like if they find it it's a good question i got a huge problem with that because it's a publicly funded uh organization national oceanic and atmospheric administration they went out they found it but they're not releasing the numbers so i would think unless there's some national security issue they should release it i don't get it but yeah uh, i would love to get photos of that one too and we could kind of bookend the story between the two shipwrecks because you could clearly see in the ohio where the Ironton hit it, right out of its stern section, there's a huge V-notch right in the side of the ship. And I would just love to see what the bow of the Ironton looks like and get some photos of it and then kind of complete this story 150 years later. Is that a normal thing to to keep like a, a, a not release numbers or keep shipwrecks basically like if someone finds it, they don't want other people to know yeah. about it. What, why is that? Go ahead, Bob. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm working on a couple right now that I may have located. And I'll tell you right now, once I've confirmed them, I'm not sharing the numbers. 
and I I don't know why it's um it's just the way things are here with private shipwreck hunters now like he said this is a government agency that found it that's funded by taxpayers that should be out to the public but you know a lot of these wrecks you know we have friends who go out and find them and you know as close of friends as we are with them they may have found 10 different wrecks and they might share one or two and then a couple of years later they'll say hey here's the numbers for this one go here and it's just kind of the way it's been not that it's right it's just the way that it's been and uh the one I'm working on now, I want my friends to dive it. I want all my friends to dive it, photograph it, do all that before anybody else. So I'm not sharing it. And when we're all done with it, <laughs> then I don't care. I like your style, Bob. Yeah, I think I, I think Nick part of that part of that's driven by you know a lot of the shipwreck hunters that are going out and just spending weekends upon weekends with a with a tow fish, and they they put tremendous hours, tremendous resources. They're, you know, they're putting fuel in the boat. So they, they put a lot into these, you know, the shipwreck hunting. And, and so I think, yeah. you know, as, as Bob said, for the first couple of years, a lot of it's just, we found it, let us go and explore it. There's eventually most of these wrecks do get released in one form or another. You know, I think about, I think about the Manasu that was found in, in 18, you know, yeah. we kind of had exclusivity of it for a couple of seasons before the numbers really became public. But they did, you know, they did become public at a certain point and, you know, people are diving it. And, you know, depending on the shipwreck, sometimes what will happen is like the Manasu is a great example of a very delicate shipwreck that after from 2018 to now we're seeing damage on it already with with like five years of diving on it with people that are you know, technically trained and, you know, supposed well, to have good buoyancy control. But, you know, we're hearing things like, you know, the guys think it's cool to run up the, the stairwell with a scooter and rips a railing off. So, it's you know, we are seeing some of that happening and, and it will happen. You know, not all, not all divers are responsible divers, unfortunately. And that's just, that's just the way of things. And that kind of goes back to trying to get photos of it pretty quickly. Like, I'm pretty proud of what we did on the Manasu. We've got some really early photos there that kind of capture the condition of it. And I would dearly love to get to the Ironton to, to go get some photos of that kind of in the as found condition and see what it looks like before people get on it. So yeah, maybe that's yeah. selfish. I don't know, but I'd like to, I'd like to show it to people. So I don't know, maybe it isn't. But I think as, as a group, you know, what's kind of interesting because Nick's question you know, I think a lot of us, I think the three of us have always been, you know, we want, we want to be more inclusive than exclusive. Most of the times, you know, we love diving wrecks and we want other people to most enjoy diving them as well. You know, there is a, there is a downside to that, but, you know, I think, I think, I think it's certainly Hefe and I are like that. And I think Bob is too, that, you know, once we've found something that, you know, is really cool, yeah. you know, we found the train, we wanted to get as many people diving the train as we could, you know, and it's just, it, it, it I think it's important for us to share that. You were one of the first people, Big T, on the the Severns, right? The Severns, Severns. How do you say that? Yeah, Severns. So that was, yeah. Ken Ken gave us the numbers for that more or less, and uh, yeah. So we had an opportunity, and you know that that particular wreck was a, it was a package freighter, and it sank immediately when it backed off the dock. It it hit a rock backing off the dock. And so it was completely loaded with all kinds of items. There was, you know, uh, ceramic jars filled with food. There's all kinds of plates. Like we literally move piles of dishes out of the way to look at something else. There's so much, but it sank so easily and so gently. You know, there's a the, the galley. We can actually go right into the galley and get, you know, I got a shot. All the dishes are neatly in the shelves. Everything is everything is there, and uh, so that was that's so cool to see that, and we want to share that with other people. But you know, again, even with that one, you know, we've more people have been diving it as of the last few years, and there has been some damage. Well, I think that's a big part of the problem. Um, example is we have a wreck here out of Chicago, which I know neither of you guys have dove. Uh, the Thomas Hume. Uh, I was probably one of the fourth or fifth guys ever to dive on that. And uh, it used to be loaded 
with dishes and pots and pans and there was some old uniforms and some shoes and stuff in there. But over the years, the numbers have gotten out and gotten public. It's now dove on a regular basis. And I think I was on it again two, three years ago. And uh, almost all of that stuff is gone. I will say the charter boats that go out there, there's zero tolerance for taking anything. I mean, you take something off the rack, you're done. You know, not only are you, you're not coming back on, on that boat. Word gets out, you're not getting on any boat. You can't do that in the Great Lakes. But people get the numbers once they get out and they take their own little private boat there and they go shopping for stuff they'd like to put in their garage and uh, it all disappears. And I think that's, that's another reason why people don't like to give out what they found is what's going to happen once the public gets it, you know, and it's not necessarily charter operators. It's more guy with his own boat and he thinks he can get out there and do what he wants. And that's become a problem at least down here. I don't think we see that as much on the deeper wrecks. We do, but yeah, you start getting deeper and there's a different level of diver that can that it takes to go there. And I think, at least I want to think, they have more respect for the shipwreck and for the history of it to leave what's down there. I'm just uh, uh, curious, is there, an, is, is there a shipwreck that hasn't been found like the elusive one the the unicorn i'm sure there's a oh, ton of them. but is there one that oh, yeah. saw like like the the most elusive one the most one you know is there well, the, griffin. The, griffin, the, the first one yeah the griffin they find it every two or three years somebody claims to have found it i think the last one turned out to be a telephone pole there was one they were claimed they found it and they were absolutely positive that they had located it and these divers said they have it and they found the safe from the boat <laughs> and it turned out it was a tugboat well the griffin was built it's from what the like early 1500s it's it was a wooden ship for exploration they had never seen these waters it was not a steel tugboat so i'm just googling the griffin right now so i know it was built by la salle who was a French explorer. Uh, it was built 1679. So it literally was the first. 1679. There were still no steel tugboats running around. But it, like I said. No, there was no steel. There was no steel boats on the Great Lakes. So the very first explorers who came to the Great Lakes, they kind of just didn't know what to do. They couldn't, they couldn't sail their ships into the lakes, right? So when they got to something like Lake Erie, they would build a ship. And in this case, the Griffin was built, and um, they used that to use the the existing routes that the the native tribes would use to get around the lakes. And so they built this ship, and it, the French explorer just talked to the natives as he moved north, and they got over to I don't know, it was near Milwaukee, right? Obviously, Milwaukee wasn't there at that time, but somewhere in that area. And on the return yeah. trip the ship was lost and it's never been found. No one knows where the hell it went. It's gone. Right. So that's the, it was the first sh sailing ship on the great lakes and consequently the first shipwreck on the great lakes as well too. And to Bob's point, like every couple of years, somebody has found the Griffin, right? That's the most famous. And they are sure it's the Griffin. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's like 50 people that are guaranteed. They, they're a hundred percent positive. They found the Griffin. So and, and and to be perfectly honest, chances are pretty good. They ran aground somewhere. The ship broke up. There's nothing left of the ship. I think if you have any chance of finding anything of the Griffin, apparently it's reported that there was one cannon mounted on the bow. That would still be there. If you can find a cannon from that time period, you can say you found something from the Griffin. But I really doubt something what 300 some years ago uh ex exploring the lakes it's likely gone yeah it, it wasn't a big ship it was pretty small 30 to 40 feet long yeah yeah you, you're not gonna find that so but that would be considered the holy grail but there's loads of shipwrecks that haven't been found that are still out there they know they've been lost but no one knows where they are i know we're keen to find the carruthers carruthers would be one yeah That'd be a good one to find. Go ahead, T. It was it was a freighter. Yeah. Well, you probably know more about it than me. You know it was a big freighter. 
of Lake Huron somewhere. So in 1913, there was a, a really tremendous storm in the fall, November 1913. Covered all of the lakes. Yeah. And uh, it was a, like a three-day storm. So there was a massive first half of the storm. Then there was a bit of a lull. So a lot of the people, captains thought, well, the storms passed. So they went up into the lakes and... Uh, and then, of course, the second half of the storm hit, which was even worse than the first. So it was really a hurricane. And it wiped out something like, I don't know, 30, 40 ships and over 200 people lost their lives. And these are big freighters. So like 1913, there was freighters sailing around that were five, 600 feet long. Like there's, there's some big ships out there. And the Carruthers was one of them, I believe. If I'm, if I'm wrong here, guys, correct me. I, but I think this is right. I'm not Googling this. So, no, no, you're, you're um, right on track. So yeah, the Carruthers was lost somewhere in Lake Huron, uh, and it's a big ship. I mean, it was 500 feet long, something like that. And to my knowledge, it's never been found unless someone's keeping it secret. But I think it's still it's still on the, on the list of things to find. That would be one. So just a, a couple. Well, I guess I feel like I have a, a last few bit of questions, but um, I know. Terry, you were saying that one of your favorite wrecks is is the Judge Harp, but uh, what are what are some of your favorite wrecks to go out and dive? This is this is our age old top five wreck discussion. So well, let's let's Ooh. let's take a go let's take a go at Ooh. that, shall we? I don't know. I I think the Cam Loops has to be up there in the top five. It's up it's up in Lake Superior off Arrayal. The Ginona has to be in the top five. The Ohio. Yeah, so you you know there's the new ones come on all the time, you know. So you know doing the Ohio and you know doing the Bradley all of a sudden. Got to put the Ohio. What about the Manasu? Ah, yeah, yeah, you know the Manasu is is up there. That's that's the problem, Nick, is they kind of jockey around, you know, in the in top five. If 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 we're allowed top ten or top twenty, it's easier discussion. But it's kind what's kind of interesting is if you think about our favorite wrecks and where they are, we do actually have them kind of nicely dispersed over you know, there's some in Superior, there's some in Lake Michigan, some in Huron. You know, I, I I think more about favorite spots I like to dive and certainly up, you know, Presque Isle, uh, which is in Lake Huron, is is a favorite yeah. haunt of ours. We love going there. There's lots of wrecks there. Good conditions. Whitefish. A lot of stuff in around the 200 foot Whitefish. range. Whitefish Point is certainly one of my favorite. That's in Southern Lake Superior. And that uh, Whitefish Bay was kind of a natural harbor that people would get out of the weather. So that's, you know, the Fitzgerald sank about 19 miles away from Whitefish Point, but there's all kinds of other stuff anywhere between 140 feet and 300 feet for diveable. And then, of course, the Fitz is up there and 500 and change. Well, I got to say, as, as far as favorites, and I think you guys might even agree with me somewhat on this one. I don't know if it's my favorite because the ones we mentioned are definitely top five or however many we named. But one of my really enjoy diving is out of Milwaukee, and it's the Prince Wilhelm. Yeah, yeah. The Willie, we call it. And, you know, you hit the top of the wreck. She's laying over on her side. It was a Dutch flag steel freighter. It's 250 foot long. It's all intact. You hit the the side of it or the top of the wreck, right? And you're in like 45 feet of water. And when you get down in the cargo holds and start exploring it, you're you're in 90 feet of water. So you you got all day. I mean, you can spend hours and hours and hours on it. And there's so much to see. Yeah. And it's three miles from shore. So it's a 10 minute boat ride and you're on a really cool wreck. Um, when I ran charters there, all my technical divers, they hated it. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. And they would tell them, if I put that wreck in 200 feet of water, you would pay me anything I wanted to take you there. Yeah. And they would because it, it's really that good and it's accessible. And that is a wreck that gets a lot of people interested in wreck diving and gives them that drive to go further and say, wait, I want to see more stuff like that. What do I have to do? And I think that's a great wreck. Uh, it's a lot of fun to dive. I mean, I went out there and spent three hours swimming around the rack. It's it's just a good time. Yeah, that's a very good point, Bob. I think, you know, that that Liberty ship and the other one I've liked that I've never dove as much as I wanted to is the Monrovia off Alpina. You know, those are those are two really yeah. cool Liberty ships. You know, have some interesting history. 
And how how about the the Daniel Morrell? Oh yeah, I do like the Morrell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get the Morrell. Yeah, where's that number yeah. eight? No, nah. <laughs> that might be top five. <laughs> yeah, I you know what's what's cool, Nick, is that you know, and we were we were kind of talking about how we might prep or not prep for the show. We, we didn't prep, no, by the way. You couldn't. Uh, you couldn't tell, style. could you? Uh, Bob's wearing yeah. pants. He prepped. What are you talking about? I had two bourbons before the show. <laughs> but I think the fascinating thing is we have we have so many shipwrecks that we can go and explore over the five lakes. And, we, you know, we really do feel blessed that we're in the middle of some of the best wreck diving in the world. You know, we, we, we'd we love to go and do some exploration in the UK. and But, you know, Pete Measley is a great example. He loves coming and diving the Great Lakes with us, you know, because it's just, there's there's a lot of detail. The ships are very well preserved. It's all fresh water. And uh, we, we recognize how, how good we have it in terms of wreck diving. And, you know, we're excited to share that. And, you know, with, with, with our photography and videos and stuff, that's kind of what we're trying to do is just, hey, come and, come and hang out with us and do some exploring. It's It's pretty cool. I think it's truly the best wreck diving in the world because of the freshwater and because of how the freshwater preserves the shipwrecks. You know, you're not going to find wrecks like this anywhere else in the world. Yeah, I think the Kamloops is a great example. On the, so the Kamloops sank in, what was that, 27, 1927 yeah. or 28, somewhere around there. And it was a package freighter and it sank off, off Isle Royale. But you can go into the hold. So it had it had everything from women's shoes to clothing to dry goods. But you can go inside the rack and th- on shelves, there are lifesavers that sank in 1927 that you can get up close and you can get a photo of the name. So the, the wrapper's still on it and you can still make out the name lifesavers. And that's that's... That's one area where, man, oh man, like if you're in the ocean, like that's gone. You won't see that. And so we're, you know, we're looking at a wreck that's nearly a hundred years ago sank, and we can make out details that that fine on a on a wreck. You know, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Well, T, you were looking at books on the Jones, right? You took photos of the book open, and you could read it, and then you did a Google search and found out what the book was, right? That's how much detail you can get. Yeah, yeah, Alicia Alicia was able to determine the name of the book. So again, all that kind of stuff helps us. Oh, she's the smart one though out of our Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. got the brains and the looks. We're just the dumbasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about what about the antelope? Where does that fit in? I didn't make it on the antelope this step last year. What? Me neither. Are you kidding You're me? With me. You were on the antelope, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was until you bailed. <laughs> the antelope's pretty special. I mean, it's got rigging. The masts are still hanging in it. So I don't know where else you could go see a ship like that. It still has all the paint on it. The name is perfectly painted still. It, it looks like it was painted yesterday. The railing still has green paint on it. The masts are still there. The ropes, uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it's hard to say what's your favorite, what's the best. That's That's not a... That's not a real question there. It's too hard to answer. It's, I can't answer that. Yeah. Well, how about this this question? What is the oldest wreck that you can dive? And then and then along with the oldest, what is the newest wreck that you could dive? Well, I mean, like newest wreck. I mean, I know of a couple like Chris Craft boats that sank four or five years ago we can go dive. But why would anybody want to do that? Yeah, pro- probably – the most recent one would be the Jodry. So it sank in 1970, 77 or 79. And it was a big freighter. It's actually in the St. Lawrence River. And it lies in 140 to 220 feet of water. And it was a big freighter. It was it was actually bigger than the Bradley, but it's not technically in the Great Lakes. And so that would be probably the most recent large shipwreck that we have we would have the opportunity to dive. In terms of the oldest, man, oh man, I don't know. You know, like you're starting to get into pretty old wrecks on the Ohio, but some of the stuff in Whitefish would be pretty old too. Like it'd be late, late 1800s. I mean, we don't know how old Petrie One is, right? But no, 
I bet you that's early 1800s, I bet, looking at it. so. Well, yeah, you got yeah. Hamilton and Scourge. War of 1812. Yeah, yeah. 1812. Yeah. yeah. So those that's getting back there. It's kind of hard to say how old, too. So I would say 150, 200 years, right? Yeah, the, the, Severns, the Severns went down in 1884. So it's probably the oldest one I've dove, Nick. That'd be probably my oldest one. Yeah, that's a tough one. But there's a there's a lot there's a lot of kind of the turn of the century. Like the stuff up in Whitefish is all late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. If you if you go to jefflindsay.ca, you can see all these shipwrecks and what dates they saw. Look at him. (laughs) (laughs) The rest of us haven't set up a website. We let Jeff do that. Shameless, (laughs) Shameless, <laughs> shameless self promotion. If you want to see good looking divers, you're gonna see me, me and Big T in all those photos. All the good photos have us in them. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll throw out some. Uh, I guess the the last question, as far as you know, someone that I, I don't think there's. I mean, maybe there is a good starting point, uh, but someone that's never dove been diving in the great lakes they want to go and try to you know explore that side of it i'm sure there's plenty of different places to go but what advice would you give to somebody that is looking to get to the great lakes somewhere um and try to get a dive in i don't know bob i think milwaukee yeah i was gonna say i think milwaukee's good uh it's a great base because you know whether you're a new diver or new to the great lakes there's, there's wrecks there that will fit every level. Uh, if you are coming to the Great Lakes, I highly recommend you're proficient in a dry suit. That's important. You could do it in less, but you're not going to be comfortable and you're not going to enjoy it. You know, you, you, you want to wear appropriate gear for that. Um, I think Milwaukee's great. Chicago's decent for the recreational diver, but a lot of those wrecks are more broken up because Chicago's much shallower down here. But Milwaukee, you can get on a little bit deeper, but still within recreational limits or run out to some deeper technical dives. I think that's a great way to go. I think the Straits of Mackinac. Straits of Mackinac as well. Absolutely. Yeah, Straits, yeah. I would recommend the Straits, which is kind of the meeting point between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Which it's hard to believe you've, you've only got, what, one dive in the Straits. I've hardly dove there. <laughs> Just the Uganda and stuff like that, right? Which is not really in the Straits, but... The Uganda and the Cedarville. In the Cedarville. But there's a lot of shipwrecks, and there's very depth. And from the little bit I've seen, it's in really good conditions. Um, it's pretty accessible. There's lots of charters in that area. Yeah, so you can kind of dial the depth and do what you want. So The, the one last area I would, I would recommend is... Uh, the St. Lawrence River is a, is a really cool spot. So you go, as as the Lake Ontario will dump into the river, St. Lawrence River, and the St. Lawrence River travels all the way out to the Atlantic. And there's lots of shipwrecks because, of course, that's part of the, the seaway, you know, that goes up all the way into the lakes. But from Kingston, Kingston, there's lots of recreational depths, 60 to 100 feet. And then in the river itself, there's, you know, all kinds of variation, right from big freighters to small schooners. You know, that's that's a cool spot. The other nice thing about the river is in the summertime, that gets quite a bit warmer. And so, you know, that is an area where, you know, in the summertime, July, it's 72 degrees top to bottom in the river. So you can dive that in a seven mil wetsuit quite easily. Uh, and that and they do promote sport diving in that that particular area. So it's it's a nice spot, too. And the, and the area is pretty, you know, you, you get some cool things to do there. But T, would you would you dive in your wetsuit? Well, T, do you own a wetsuit? No, <laughs> I told Nick on my first podcast I use my wetsuit in the shower. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> That's right. Now I will. We, we will be using wetsuit and bikini though. Yes. Yes. Very nice. Yeah, that's coming up in May. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming on to the podcast. This has been awesome. Big T, Hefe, the dude. Uh, this has been a great group. So thank you very much for coming on to the podcast and telling me a little bit more about the Great Lakes. It was great being here. Thanks a lot, Nick. It's been great speaking with you again. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for having us, Nick. Offcasting, a scuba podcast.